This is the Armed Forces Radio Service. The big thing that uh, people within living memory will, will know about is the Battle of the Atlantic and the fact that the, the city played a major role. And again, it's all about location. It's simply the fact that um, when Hitler declares war in Poland and World War II starts, um, there's convoys coming from America bringing in food and uh, I suppose everybody automatically thinks of chewing gum and uh, nylons. It's a lovely social of social interest that all the same because you know un until World War Two and the Americans coming in here, we had never uh, seen a hamburger. We had never seen a hot dog, uh, and suddenly that culture is injected into us. I think you can see that uh, when you look at uh, Sir Max Horton taking the surrender of the German High Command at Lisa Halley at the end of World War II, when all the submarines were brought here, some were uh, scuttled, some were sold off to other com uh, countries, uh, but basically it was taken here to show the importance, and there's some great photographs of that, of Horton coming up a conning tower of a submarine, and you can see uh, German uh, soldiers, German submariners rather, surrendering and, and then being taken off to Belfast for interrogation. But because all those um, convoys were coming from America with all that important stuff, um, the Germans had a German had a U-boat centre at Brest in France and they were leaving there to come into the Atlantic to attack. Uh, so there needed to be a base which could feed out into the Atlantic, feed out the boats to attack the U-boats to protect the convoys. Uh, so Derry became that centre, and navies from all over the world, literally from all over the world. I mean, there are stories of uh, boats being on the foil and people being able to walk all across the river without getting their feet wet, you know, just from deck to deck to deck to deck. I don't know if it's true, but I'm quite happy to listen to it. Uh, there's also plenty of stories, you know, of the girls in the factories. They knew more about the movements of the boats than some of the sailors themselves because they were interested in, you know, who's going to go to the dance tonight. Uh, so you're going to get the stories of them spotting the boats coming in and saying, right, there's going to be Canadians in, there's going to be Americans, there's going to be this, there's going to be that, the other. And of course, the Americans were here before 41. They were building places like Lissa Halley, and they came over as technicians, they were referred to, because they weren't in uniform. And it's only after uh, Christmas 41, when Pearl Harbor happens, that the American Navy officially comes into the war. And then they suddenly, overnight, appeared on the streets of Derry in naval uniform. And that, that social culture is fascinating. I find it, it's a part of oral history I'm very, very interested in. But if you take, um, well, you're not going to enjoy the next bit, but I'm going to tell you anyway. <laughs> uh, if you take a, a, an Irishman singing a song like On the Street Where You Live, yeah. he'll stay with the beat. You know, I have often walked down, and go on like that. The Americans came in, and their last landfall was New York, say, or New Jersey, or wherever. And they've got a completely different style of music. And their next landfall is here in Derry. And they bring the Sinatras of this world, who sing in the offbeat. I have often walked down. And suddenly the people of Derry are exposed to this for the first time. And you get all these lovely stories of the people in the dance hall shouting out, Hey, for goodness sake, Will you sing in some sort of time so we can dance to it? So it's a whole social aspect of it, you know, that, that, that I think it should be explored. I'm sure there's a thesis in it. If you look at that, the introduction of hamburgers, the introduction of hot dogs, the chewing gum, the nylons, all that stuff, then I think there's a whole thesis in that. But Derry is the important place for the Battle of the Atlantic. Derry almost had a charmed life. Uh, you know, you hear about the Blitz in Belfast, 
and the Blitz in London. But uh, only one plane dropped bombs in Derry. We're not too sure if it's a Hankel 111 or it's a Yonkers 88. I haven't been able to find that out. But the, the mortar fell and people tell you it glanced off St. Patrick's arm at Pennyburn Chapel and landed in a sand pit. Despite that, 13 people were killed that night. Uh, one lady told me, she said I was upstairs with a baby in my arms. I come down the stairs with a baby and the stairs came after me. You know, it was a, it was a really bad night. I talked to uh, an ARP warden at the time and he started his presentation off quite funnily, really, I suppose. He said it was a beautiful night for bombers. And I said, you need to going to have to explain that. He said, it was a lovely moonlit night. Mm -hmm. And uh, he was down helping people, you know, take out the dead from Pennyburn. Um, and in those days, you know, gas came straight into the house on a pipe. And many houses would have sort of hooked an iron up to it and lit it, you know. But he remembers that the gas pipe was broken and had ignited. And was almost like a candle, you know, burning in the house. Um, for the people to see what was happening, what was going on. So it was a big, big night, and you found that after that, uh, folks, there was no Cregan in those days. I mean, Cregan's 47, 48, 49. So 43, 44, 45, uh, people were going out to just around the town and taking blankets and pillowcases and pillows with them and sleeping in the opening, in the open, sorry, because of the fear of being bombed again, although thankfully it never happened. And that obviously wasn't a strategic bombing, I mean it was just... No, the, many people will tell you it was a pure accident, the guy was in a position where he needed to get rid of it because he was running out of fuel. Right. And uh, what he saw was a lot of, what protected the port was a lot of the smoke from the chimney fires in and around the bog. Uh, and that sort of put a blanket over the town. Uh, so he couldn't actually see the port, so he dropped him when he thought he was in the right position. But as I said, Derry was... Lucky is not the right expression, but it explains it kind of what I mean. Because of the proximity of the border, folks here never really went without anything. You know, you could always nip over for yeah. butter, or nip over for eggs, or nip over for, for cigarettes. There was a trade going on constantly, uh, and they didn't have the same difficulties as getting food uh, as they would. I mean, one of the, the reasons being that if you go back to the river again, you know, half of it is in Donegal and the other half's in the north. So, you know, there, there was never going to be a problem really about getting food. Uh, and that even manifested itself in the girls in the factory, you know, with their weekly clubs or half yearly clubs. When they got some money together, they would cross the border to get a new dress or a new pair of shoes or, you know, there was always that happening in the city. And there was almost an air of partying. In the town, you know, when the boats came in, there was dances going on, and there were so many ballrooms in the city, so many stories about it. Uh, it just was a, to, to a degree, it was a fun time, as opposed to what was happening in London and Belfast and places like that. So if you don't feel so hot, go out to some joisy spot, whether you're hip or not, the Jersey bounce will make you sweet. Americans, I don't know about mainly, but I know that they built for themselves uh, Springtown, right. Springtown Camp, which were the Nissen huts, and they also built for themselves some Nissen huts uh, at Beach Beach Hill, the hotel just out by Ardmore. Um, but Springtown was big. Springtown was like a, an American town. It had soda fountains. It had its own cinema. It had everything that the troops you know, would feel at home and it even had on one occasion Bob Hope uh, came to sing for them or came to entertain them and in fact not to be outdone uh, at Pelipper House which is a plantation house in Dungiven uh, the British Army officers were stationed there and Vera Lynn came there to sing for them 
So we had Vera Lynn coming to entertain the troops here, and we had Bob Hope doing his bit at Springtown. And of course, Springtown uh, contributed greatly when the war was over because the, I suppose, atrocious housing conditions in Derry at that time were such that these Nissen huts were suddenly emptied and people flocked to get into them. And, you know, for the first time, and I'm not being derogatory, I'm not being anything other than truthful, they found that they had a bathroom yeah. and toilets indoors and stuff like that. You know, for many people, that those facilities would have been out, outside in the backyard. But these were suddenly all available. The Nissen huts were emptied. The Americans had gone back home, so people moved into springtime. The great news ran through the land. Manchester, Glasgow, Cardiff, Birmingham, London. In every town and village, big and small. You know, there's an expression in Derry, if people think something's important enough, they'll run buses to it. You know? <laughs> well, they ran buses down to the U-boats around. <laughs> and they did, literally. And I talked to one of the Wrens, uh, who was invited down that day. And she had a completely different angle on it, uh, which I find surprising, and I find myself sympathising with her. She said that she was standing there, and uh, Sir Max Horton came out onto the deck of the submarine, and the, the highest-ranking German submariner stepped forward, and he took off his cap very reverently, and he put it under his arm, and he held out his hand to shake hands with Horton, who completely ignored him, walked past him. And she said she ended up feeling sorry, you know, for the German, because of the way he was being treated. Um, she said she just didn't see the need for that at all. And when you think of the stories which had been circulating all during the war about the way things were happening in Germany and all over the world, it's a strange reaction to it, you know. It is. Equally, she told me that she had been standing on the steps of the Guildhall and an American shore patrol walked past. Now, you could tell the difference between an American shore patrol and a British shore patrol because the British shore patrol wore hobnail boots and you could hear them for miles, whereas the, the American shore patrol wore rubber sole boots and they sort of crept up. <laughs> but as this shore patrol walked past the steps of the Guildhall, she was standing looking out onto Guildhall Square. And there was a man in the middle of the shore patrol. And she said to somebody, who's that? And the expression she used, she said, who's that wee man? To discover it was Eisenhower. Now, I kind of doubted that Eisenhower had been in the city. But I was talking to a group of people about a month after I'd heard that story. And this lady in the audience said, well, uh, my husband, his job was to fly people into uh, Eglinton. For the, with the RAF but he was never allowed to know who the VIPs were and on this occasion he didn't know but a week after he got a great big box of cigars from his VIP so you know there's a probability uh, I suppose we could check it out that Eisenhower was here in the city during World War II <laughs> 